uh, members of the Nemo for Lions Club. We're putting on this uh, second annual uh, Nemo for Lions Club Fall Festival and Car Show at Harrybrook Park. I represent the United States Army Reserves uh, in recruiting. I'm here in the Harrybrook Park. Uh, providing information about the Army and the Army Reserves. Uh, the, thank you for the Lions Club that invited us over. At the time I was renting a place in New Milford and I also worked in New Milford. And so I would come on my lunch break and just walk that paved circle. I found Harry Brook one day when my, my daughter told me about it and I, I was never over here. And I, uh, I have a prosthetic leg and uh, I ride a hand cycle and uh, the path here at Harry Brook is great uh, for my training. We enjoyed the park for probably 10 years, I would say, and then the children got older and we came less and less, and then there were a lot of years when I didn't come at all. So it was quite a shock when I came back uh, about five, six, seven years ago. Our campaign, by the way, is to restore the park and that's what our intentions are. I asked him how this got to be called Harry Brook and he told me and this is from him himself. I had a lovely dog one time. Iris Setter loved him. His name was Harry. In case you haven't noticed there's a brook out back of the house. Harry Brook Estate. <laughs> Frank A. Hardin was a descendant of an old family of linen weavers. The Atchison Hardin Company, founded in the 1860s in the north of Ireland by Atchison Hardin, manufactured handkerchiefs. Upon the death of the founder of the business was continued by his sons David, Charles, and James. In the late 1800s, the company's Belfast plant was destroyed by fire and discontinued the manufacture of handkerchiefs in Ireland. In 1889, James Harden started manufacturing handkerchiefs in Passaic, New Jersey, serving the American market. In his 34-year career, he built the largest handkerchief factory in the world. When he died in 1914, his sons, James Jr. and Frank A. Harden, continued the business. The Hardens were excellent people. They treated me just like a son. I had a run of the house. I could do anything I wanted. Frank Harden spent his early life in the north of Ireland. In 1941, the H. H. Taylor & Son Company completed building a home for Frank A. Harden, a home that in many ways was the realization of a dream. Mr. and Mrs. Harden were married here at Harrybrook on June 15, 1943. My parents were hired here through a friend of my father's that knew Harden and we came here. My mother was a cook, my father was a butler. I was one year old and that was 47 we came here. We had, uh, as kids, we had to run to the pool at any time, weekends, while they were here, as long as I asked, for kids to go swimming and have parties and stuff, as long as they didn't get out of hand. And as I got older, I got to know more about the Hardens, and he was kind of a loner, but friendly. And when he was here, he wanted nothing, nothing to do with business. As long as I was here, I only saw him on the phone at one time, and that was one morning. He used to get up. He'd go to bed at 2 and get up around 11 or 12. And there was a lot of foam coming down the river and he knew it came from the hat factory. Well, that was the only time I saw him on the phone, yelling, screaming, swearing, 
and after that the foam stopped. Life down here was very, very good. He was very nice. Both of them were very nice to people, to the kids, to everybody. And at one point, I think I was about 10 years old, Mrs. Harden was very into stitchery, crafts and stuff, and she came out of the sunroom. Somebody knocked at the door, and she would, instead of having my parents answer the door, she would do it herself. So she got up and she had a pair of scissors in her hand, and she tripped and fell out here in the foyer, and it cut her straight across here, down through here, and at that time they weren't into plastic surgery that much. So my mother took care of her, my father took her to the hospital, and that was, that's one thing that had happened to her. And she was fine after that. So she always wanted me to have money in my pocket. So she would say to me, Kurt, let's play backgammon. And she could beat me hands down. But she always let me win at the end, and we were always playing for $20, $30. And at, at the end, I said, oh, I'm gonna lose this money and I don't have it, and then she'd do something so I would win. Mrs. Harden was sitting out here and she says, Kurt, we gotta run those rapids. And I said, well, we don't have a canoe. She says, we will have one by next Saturday. And these rapids run all the way down to the bridge. As it was, we never did anything. But we did go down below the bridge on, in the calm water and we canoed all the way down the Still River to uh, Lake Lonona. She was a younger lady, a lot younger than he was, and she was just full of fun. There wasn't anything that they didn't want or need. She would buy anything she wanted to. She had an open checkbook, and he just always told her, don't buy junk. If it's something you can use, Help yourself, you have your own checkbook. And, and therefore, I mean, she bought me a boat, motorboat, and she bought me a canoe. It was nothing that she would not, I would never ask for anything, but she would always come up with, with good stuff. Like if she would see me target shooting, she'd make sure that uh, I had a nice gun. Everything had to be nice, nice. Uh, as far as boat rides, I took her out in the motorboat. Out in the lake we went down to, uh, well, we, down to Little Onona. We, at that point, the falls were not there. They were gone in 55 when they put the dam in, or that era, and we went down Lake Little Onona. Her hobby was knitting and crafts, and, if you, and picture collecting, paintings. These are his and her pictures. He was a fanatic about this type. He was out of Playboy and stuff. That was his big thing. She collected a lot of baby pictures, a lot of them. In fact, I, I almost think she probably always wanted a baby because I was like a son to her. He would get up at, we'll say, 11 or 12 o'clock and then he would walk the property and come in and sit down and have a drink, have some lunch, have a cigar. And then he would go, go off and do something outside and he'd come back in and she would sit in her chair in the sunroom and do needlework all day. It used to take two men, I'd say 10 hours a day to keep this place up. He was a fanatic about neatness Everything had to be perfect. If he was out walking and he saw a stick or a paper and we didn't just have a storm, he would pick it up, put it in his pocket. This TV came when I was about 14. This is where we lived while we were here at Harry Brook, while my parents were working for Hardin's. This is the kitchen, living room behind me, three bedrooms and a bath. And as you can see, it's being all done over so somebody could move in. My parents at that point had retired. Okay, and that was right after she passed away. And I, I don't remember her age, but it was a year before he died. Frank Atchison Harden 
died on March 3, 1965, at the age of 80. He left an estate worth about $16 million. In his will, he stipulated that his home, known as Harry Brook, be left in trust for the benefit, health, recreation, and pleasure of the residents of New Milford, Connecticut. The $1 million trust was held by the United States Trust Company of New York City. The income of that trust would be used to maintain the park operated by a board of management that comprised the three Milford residents selected by the trustees. The first board included first selectman Russell V. Carlson, Benjamin H. Stone, and Kenneth F. Taylor. Under the terms of the will, the main house and its contents would be maintained as a museum. I got involved back in 2000 when uh, Walter Kahn and um, Mark Wiston asked me to come aboard. In the will, uh, they, they asked for or to, to create a board of managers, which would be, res their responsibility would be the management of the park, uh, to manage uh, the upkeep uh, and to uh, plan for the future and take care of the things that's needed. The bank handled the funds, that's it. They had nothing to do with the day-to-day -day management of the park. So our functions are pretty much to um, contract with oil, with fuel, with insurance companies, anything we can to keep our costs down uh, and also to uh, take care of the needed repairs that are uh, like you would at your own home or, or your own business as they, as they come up. So we're constantly meeting and meeting at the park and um, talking about how we can improve it, how can we can raise, raise some funds, prioritizing the, the needs of the park, um, the repairs of the tractors, uh, the replacement of the tractors, the, any equipment, any purchases that are made uh, are um, approved by the, the, the two of the three board members. Um, again, because we're business owners, we meet once a month and we generally are always in attendance, but uh, there's always at least two of us around, so if something popped up on an emergency basis, we can be there within the hour. We had a local um, a retired history teacher in Milford High School, uh, J. Russ, J. Russell Nicholas, he came on board. Uh, along with the same time was Jack Buzak. Jack Buzak was, has been back president of the Milford Lions. He's a local business owner, owns a construction for, firm, uh, Chestnut Lane Construction. I've been on the board for approximately five years. I got involved to help preserve the park because the park was in need of preservation. It's been going downhill. Um, been involved in the community through the Lions Club. We're also involved in deeply with Harry Brook. Unfortunately, Mr. Nicholas uh, had an illness and passed, and we replaced him uh, most recently with Bill Deke, who is the owner of Deke Electric. When uh, former board of manager Russ Nicholas passed away, a uh, vacancy opened up. And uh, because we were so active in the park, we were asked to take his spot and uh, graciously uh, accepted. So we. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to plan some good things. Um, we, uh, we have a pretty major fundraising campaign uh, getting uh, started for the spring. Uh, we're pretty excited about, um, and we're hoping to uh, do some major improvements to the park. The New Milford Lions Club has always ha had a special place in their heart for Harrybrook Park, and they've, they've uh, built at their own expense two pavilions that we use down there. Um, for uh, different functions that people are able to uh, rent them either for um, class reunions, uh, company meetings, um, weddings, um, family parties, whatever. Uh, and the Lions Club through the years has been, uh, they, they've been just a, a great uh, advocate for the park. They've done a lot of work down there. Uh, they've volunteered a lot of time. Uh, they're there every spring and every fall with helping us with the spring and fall cleanup. The, uh, the event was uh, 
um, an idea to raise money for the park. Uh, the park reached out to the town of Milford to uh, uh, raise some additional monies. Um, unknown to a lot of people in the Milford Harrybrook Park, it's not a town-owned park. It uh, actually um, was a private estate from the late Frank Harden, who generously left it to the town upon his death and with an uh, endowment fund to uh, cover maintenance costs of the park. However, over time, the uh, maintenance costs uh, over exceeded what was uh, allowed for the endowment costs. So uh, Harry Brook reached out to the community for help, and the New Milford Lions stepped up to the plate and came up with the idea for a fall festival and car show. Hi, I'm at the fall festival at Harry Brook Park. I drive a 1940 Plymouth pickup. It's my baby. I've had it for uh, a little over a year now. It's got a 350 Chevy motor in it, and uh, it's a lot of fun to drive, and I'm enjoying the day. Hey, I'm Dick Hinckley from Brookfield, Connecticut, and uh, it's my 1939 GMC truck and uh, the Fall Festival at Harrybrook Park. And it used to be a fire truck, and uh, now it's a big pickup. I did all the work myself on it, and it's a driver, turnkey, drive it anywhere. 1947 Ford Business Coupe, all restored from the frame up. You want to know what's in it and all that? Yeah, anything you want to say about it. Uh, a 302 Ford in it, C4 automatic, Ford rear end. The paint job's been farmed out, you know, and the body work. But not done yet. I still got to get the headliner in. You and do the, the work yourself? Uh, I'm going to do the headliner in the interior, but this work here I had to farm out, the paint job and the and the, and the uh, body work. And our famous hum Humvee, which is uh, very popular and owned by a lot of people. It carries personnel, also carries uh, communication equipment, computers, and that's why you notice the, the long antenna in the back. Actually, this vehicle right here is a 2010. Just came out of manufact manufacturing in 2010. I am Rob Sadler. I'm here at the uh, Fall Festival at Harrybrook Park with uh, my wife and our two cars. Uh, we have a uh, 1965 Cobra and a uh, 2001 uh, Plymouth Prowler. Um, beautiful day and hope everybody enjoys the show. It's a 1967, it's all original, and it's a great fit for the car show. Everyone come down and enjoy the day. Uh, we're doing a blacksmithing demonstration, and uh, we've been making um, all sorts of hooks and uh, grilling forks. What Mike's holding up is a, um, a small cooking fork. Uh, we use that for either a reenactment or when we camping, flipping over bacon, grilling. The other one we just made here today, a little bit ago. Hi, and we're from uh, New Milford right here. This is our hometown, and we go to fairs and shows all over New England and Pennsylvania, New York State, New Jersey State Fair. And we do about 60 fairs a year, and these are Texas Longhorn oxen. This is Bob, and this is Tex. And uh, Bob has horns that are 70 inches, six feet across from tip to tip. And Tex has horns that are 64 inches, and their Texas Longhorn is the breed. And Ox is a castrated bull, which can be from any dairy breed or beef breed. One of the requirements is that they have horns. And of course, all these beautiful fairs started because of the competitive nature of our ancestors. And uh, if they weren't so competitive and they couldn't stand to see their neighbor growing a big pumpkin and they, uh, they knew that theirs was bigger, so they said, let's go down to the town green and see if we can uh, have a fair. And that's how it started. It all started that way. It didn't start with pizza and all the lovely foods that we have. And agriculture still plays a huge part in, in uh, all the fairs and shows that we go to. I'll be in the New York City Marathon this year, November 7th, and uh, with my hand cycle. And uh, thanks to Harry Brook, it's given me a place that I can train. 
it's just, and the people here are great. The caretaker and the friends of Harry Brook, they're just, just wonderful people. Uh, in a nutshell, it, it, it's a great place, and without Harry Brook, uh, it would be, uh, uh, the, the town of New Milford uh, w wouldn't be as uh, wonderful a place as it is. I'm Lisa, I'm the caretaker at Harry Brook. I've been here as the caretaker for five years. I've lived in the park for 15. Over there is the pond, uh, which we're working on refurbishing, hopefully, in the next few years. It needs to be reclaimed and hopefully put in fountains eventually. The garden is the, in the fenced-in area. We've gotten some volunteers from the Master Gardener program at UConn to start rehabbing the gardens. Right now, the trail starts at the back of the museum here, and it goes up over the hill and leads around to the back of the back side of the con pavilion. And then hopefully this spring, we have another Boy Scout coming to connect, and it'll lead all the way around along the edge of the river and come out behind the large pines down by the barn. We had a group from Bible Baptist Church came and uncovered this trail. This was completely covered in topsoil and pachysandra. They dug it all out. They also worked on the mountain laurel patch. They got all the weeds and overgrowth out. So eventually we'll plant something in there and get it looking nice again. Home Depot donated this table to us and a bunch of sections for the garden for the garden fence. So little by little, it's coming back. That building is the old pool house equipment shed, um, and it's in serious need of attention. Right now we call it the vulture shed because the vultures are living in there. Okay, the blue surround is the pool, the outline of the pool. Um, I've actually started digging it out because most of it was hidden and I think it kind of looks cool to be able to see where it was. And um, we've started cleaning this area up and eventually this will be another small picnic area. There's still all the old, the old pumps and everything are still in that shed. When Mr. Harden lived here, there were lights everywhere. You can see all the lamp posts. There was a lamp there. There were lamps, street lights all down the roadways. It must have been just gorgeous. There's the pool house cabana. The changing rooms are now bathrooms, but they used to be the old changing rooms for the pool house. There was a snack or a, a small kitchenette in the back side of the pool house here. It's just storage now. Yeah, that's the carriage house slash barn slash garage. And there's the peacock shed is the small building across the driveway from the barn. Everybody remembers the peacocks. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I actually don't. I think I have a vague memory of the peacocks. What happened to the peacocks? They went down the road. <laughs> they went away. Somebody didn't want to take care of peacocks anymore. Now, from what I gather, when Mr. Harden lived here, the park didn't make the whole loop. It only came to the barn. Um, all that was just wild down that end. It wasn't until the park became a park that they made the loop and opened that up. But we came up with the idea of getting, of, of creating a support group, if you will, and we've founded what we call the Friends of Harrybrook. Um, and what that group was, meant to do and we have put it together they have now we've been in existence for about two years now their support group to us the board of managers um, they now have their own board of managers for the friends of harry brook and they support us with um, uh, fundraising um, again with uh, manpower and helping clean up uh, and get ready uh, for the for the different uh, functions that we have at the park it's a beautiful fall day, a little overcast, but the sun has been shining, and we're cleaning up the park. 
in preparation for a couple events coming up, one of which is the Pumpkin Festival. So we have a few volunteers today helping us with the leaves and the brush. And as you can see in my truck, that's an example of what we've been doing all day. You just saw Jeff, my husband. We're both on the Friends of Harry Brook, a volunteer group that got together about two years ago, a little over two years, to try and maintain and enhance this beautiful park that we're in. We gardeners are trying to keep um, all the native plants that were here before the park was actually donated. So we accept any donations from nurseries or any of the members who want to donate plants and then we place them where we think they will be the most effective. Economics pl took a heavy toll on the park and uh, when I learned that a group was being organized to try to help it, I wanted to join. I wanted to join because I knew it was going to be a hands-on group. I knew that I could go and help with the gardening, I could help with the cleanup, I could do jobs and get a real sense of satisfaction. Now we have some structure to the Friends of Harry Brook. We have a board of directors, we have a uh, uh, president and a secretary and a treasurer. Um, and we kind of quantified what the Friends of Harry Brook's mission is. And it's basically to um, financially, spiritually, and physically support uh, Harry Brook Park uh, through fundraising and volunteer efforts. When I learned that the park was having problems financially, I wanted to help where I could. So I became a friend of Harry Brook Park in the fall of 2009. And since becoming a friend, uh, it's given me an opportunity to get the message out to the community that there's a lot of ways the community can help with preserving and protecting the park for future generations. Because I want my children to continue to come here. I want it to continue to be a passive recreational park. We decided to come up with some fundraising ideas and I came up with the idea of having a pumpkin festival at the park, a Halloween theme, not gory, but nice and spooky. Uh. Um, Lou and I really enjoy Halloween, so we brainstormed and got a committee together and came up with the idea of having a pumpkin festival or a jack-o'-lantern festival at the park along with some costume people and opening up to whoever could come that night and it turned out to be a bigger success than we could ever have hoped for. We had over 2,000 people here. People were leaving saying what a great time they had. It was a wonderful evening. It was just such a pleasure. And we decided as a committee for the Pumpkin Festival that any funds raised would go directly to restoring and reclaiming the, the park pond, which is in very bad shape right now. We were very happy to raise over $6,000 that night. And the Lions Club donated an additional $200. So I think we made an almost an excess of something like when everything was sent like, something like $6,600. And we're going to have it again. The only problem that we really came across was coming up with the necessary volunteers. The public was wonderful. The community came out in full force. People came that evening who just never walked one foot in this park, could not get over how beautiful it was. So it was beneficial in every capacity. It was just the best night, and we're gung-ho to do it again. I will to pass this place on to the city of New Milford when I passed away. That was back in March of 1965. My wife Elizabeth almost robbed the cradle with her. She was only 34 and I was 61 when we were when 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 we were married back in 1941. Passed the place on to New Milford, had a lot of money, it was in the handkerchief business. Well, gave him a million dollars to maintain it after that. Now we're collecting some money here from all you good people to fix this pond over here. They call it a duck pond. If old Harry was here, there wouldn't be any ducks out there, I can tell you that. Um, my name is Tamara Curry. I'm the advisor for the Danbury chapter of People First. People First is a national self-advocacy organization for people with disabilities. We're also affiliated with WeCare, the Western Connecticut Association for Human Rights. And 
every year we have a picnic at Harry Brook Park, and we love coming here. And there's a lot of things that we want to do to upgrade the place and put it back to where it was. It's not going to be done overnight. It's going to take years and money. So the sad part is in the economy, of course, the private funding doesn't stretch as far as it did years ago. But I think that we can really deal with it. I think that once the public understands what this is about and what a treasure this is, a true treasure, I think people are going to come out of the woodwork. That's my hope. I think that it's just a word of mouth that needs to be spread and explain what the dynamics of the park is and where the money is coming from. But I love the idea that the town can't come in and dictate what people can do here, that there's a group of people who truly love the whole idea of the park.